Welcome to the inaugural episode of Talking to Vet, where we delve into the transformation of education through technical vocational education and training in St. Lucia. I am your host, Phil Henderson. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Michelle Charles, the outgoing permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education. We'll explore her passion for Tibet, the personal experiences that shaped her advocacy, and the visionary transformation of four secondary schools into Tibet-focused institutions. In our corner of the world, where the one-size-fits-all model of education and standardized examinations often fall short, we'll discuss how Tibet seeks to address the diverse intelligences and unique talents of our students, creating a more equitable and functional educational landscape. Join us throughout this journey as we uncover the challenges, policies, and long-term benefits of this groundbreaking initiative. I'd like to welcome today's guest, Dr. Michelle Charles. Thank you, Dr. Charles, for being here with us. Can I call you Dr. Charles? Can I call you Michelle? Or do oh, I call Michelle you? is just fine. All right. Yes. Well, I have a sister named Michelle. Oh, it's, so it's a beautiful the, name. It's a lovely name. I love the name. Um, I really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time being here with us to discuss this thing mm -hmm. um from my understanding this project is something that you've been working on in the background for a long long time and you know happy to see it on the front burner yeah, well thank you very much Phil, for having me here and i'm really excited when it comes to talking tv this is something that i have quite a passion for and i'm excited to be here and i understand i'm the first guest on the show you are the first so, episode first guest let's see how it goes yes. <laughs> give me a little bit of um i heard you the outgoing permanent secretary at the time of filming mm -hmm. um tell me a little bit about your tenure i heard that you've been a teacher and and you've held many other hats. Yes, I have. I've been working as a public servant. I can call myself a career civil servant. And for the past 36 years, mm -hmm. I started first as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So my first career opportunity was in education as a teacher at the Miku Infant School. Mm -hmm. And throughout this journey, I've delved into different areas. I've worked in meteorology. I've worked as an accountant in infrastructure, financial analyst. And then I finally found myself at the Ministry of Education, first as a deputy permanent secretary and then as the permanent secretary. For those of us who may not have an understanding of what those roles mean, let's speak about permanent secretary. What exactly exactly is the role or the function of a PS? Oh, the PS's role is one that is immense. You have a lot of responsibility. And the Ministry of Education is a very big one. As a matter of fact, the, the, the departments that I was responsible for was included not only education, but also innovation and vocational, technical and vocational training. And it's your responsibility to ensure that the mandate of the various departments are met, but also all of the administrative functions that come with it and the financial aspects as well. So, yes. Good, good. Um, today, specifically, we'd like to delve into just one, you know, one feather mm -hmm. in the heart of yours. Um, tell me a little bit about Tivet. What brought you to wanting to see this change in the education system in St. Lucia? I can remember one of my very first conversations on TVET, probably in late 2016 or early 2017 with Mr. Samuels, the then education officer for TVET. And after that meeting, I concluded that TVET was the best kept secret at the Ministry of Education. Um, but, and recognizing the opportunities that it provided, mm -hmm. the contribution that it could make to economic growth, the potential for persons to become entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. opportunities to improve the quality of life, I could not help but want to make it my mission to ensure that TVET was on the agenda of our education reform process. Lo lovely. And uh, I mean... In this whole project, most consider that the biggest stakeholders of this is the students. How, what is the reception of the students that you have been interacting with or the parents of students that you have been acting, um, interacting with and how do they feel about this so far? I think generally based on the conversations we have had, persons are relieved that the ministry is moving in that direction. There's been a great acceptance for TVET. Mm -hmm. Persons have always felt that this is the, the, the way the ministry should go. This is the trajectory that we should have been on. Of course, there are some little concerns, you know, some, some, some queries that they have but i think with proper advocacy marketing promotion that these concerns can be addressed and that is what we are here to do today i know you spoke of uh, the good about it maybe we could touch on a challenge or two what are some of the challenges you have faced in the process of developing and advocating for the tivet transformation project 
Yes, I think one of our biggest riddles really has to do with the perception of TVET. Mm-hmm. Many people believe that TVET is a second tier education. It's education for persons who are non-academic. You know, we call our, we say our students are not bright, but really this is not so. And so changing the mindset of persons has been one of the challenges. And unfortunately, sometimes this is one of the views that is pushed by maybe persons within our own education system, which is rather unfortunate. So, you know, changing the mindset and getting persons to accept the change. You know, resistance to change, I guess, is inevitable. And so these are some of the hurdles that we have faced trying to push this initiative. Okay. We spoke about the good. We spoke about some of the challenges mm-hmm. in my research and, you know, in being involved in this project. What you speak to is what I face as well. It is the stigma. Wow. When surveyed, most of our St. Lucian people of, across mm-hmm. all education, educational backgrounds uh, stem from the belief that Tibet is for those who are good with their hands. And this is something that is not necessarily true. And in just in my understanding of the project, it's quite a robust project. There's a balance between technical mm-hmm. and academics as well. But before we go into that, I need to ask you a question. What was that initial thought? What is that initial idea that brought Tivet to light within the Ministry of Education? I can say that maybe about 2018. Yeah. I mean, Tivet has always been something within the Ministry of Education, just as I indicated, a, good, a, good, a very good secret. But in 2018, that's when every effort was made to make um, TVET may be more visible. Mm-hmm. And so when the ministry launched our hashtag Educate St. Lucia, TVET was included as one of the pillars and er- as an area of focus that we figured could help us with the revolutionization of the education sector. And so at that point, TVET became an agenda item, mm-hmm. forefront on the agenda. And that was quickly followed by a successful pitch to the World Bank, mm-hmm. where, which eventually resulted in the approval of what is now the Human Capital Resilience Project. And this project is one that is geared towards developing skills, strengthening our educate our TVET sector. And this has there have been many other projects and initiatives that have followed since. Mm-hmm. All of them geared towards developing skills and competencies for economic growth. We can speak of Sky, we can speak of Jepsed, but all of those seek to develop the skills and competencies of our citizens. Okay, Michelle, thank you for that. Uh, what drew you? to this project, <laughs> this whirlwind of a project, if I may say so. Yes, and Tibet is indeed a whirlwind of a project, especially this transformation. I could see this passion was really ignited when I was part of a contingent that was part of the Community College Administrative Program in Florida in 2020. Mm-hmm. And visiting the Tallahassee Community College and the Gulf, Gulf Coast Community College, that's where the concept of workforce development really started taking root. And then I realized, you know, the engagement, the way, the way they approached um, skills development and the way industry was involved, this really sparked my interest. And since then, I think, I mean, there has been no turning back. We spoke about your, your, your history as, as a career professional <laughs> that we spoke about. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to something. I'd like to draw the attention of the audience to something. Michelle, what would you say was the gap in our education system that you saw that you wanted to fix with this Tivet project? That's a very interesting question. And I can tell you that at the Ministry of Education, we, we listen to our stakeholders. And I think one of the, the points that had been brought up on a number of occasions was the lack of diversity in our program offering that we expected all of our students to write the common entrance exam and then all go to a secondary school. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, they write the same CXCs, whether or not, you know, this is something that they're interested in. And so for us, we looked and we noted too that when this happened, there's also a very high dropout rate because our students are telling us that they're not passionate about what they're doing. They're not doing things that really can t- catch the interest, things that they really love. And what TVED does too is that it allows us to be able to develop skills and competencies in our learners. Apart from what happens within the Ministry of Education, we also have to look at the broader picture, where you look at what the labor market needs are in terms of skills. And so we were guilty of graduating a number of students who had, we graduated some of them with skills, but not necessarily the skills that the market required. And so the TVET program would allow us, this transformation at our secondary schools would allow us to, you know, address this on many fronts. Our students would now get an opportunity to 
move into career areas that they are passionate about, and it would also help us narrow that skills gap that the labor market and industry partners speak of. How would you say that this aligns with your personal vision? For education? For education. Indeed, I think it does very well because I see the future of education as being one that leverages technology and at the same time diversifies our education offerings. And this TVET transformation at our school allows us to be able to do just that. Our students are now going to be moving towards programs that speak to their passion, allow them to develop careers in areas that that they really love, that they're interested to spark their creativity. And so I think our education system, the future of education, should be one that embraces all of this. After all, the, the entire world has moved on mm-hmm. and embraced TVET. So we are now just catching up. Even though all this hard work has been done in the background, we are just about at the, truthfully in the beginning stages of the next chapter of this TVET project. Uh, but let me ask you, Michelle, uh, for any new initiative to work, there must be something we call policy alignment. Mm-hmm. How well would you say does our policies in education and government as a whole enable this new TVET initiative and what are some of the possible policy considerations? I would say that our, this move is very much aligned with policy directives. After all, the administration, our government, speaks to TVET and places a high priority on TVET. And that there is no deviation between their policy statement and what is captured within our education develop, sector development plan, which speaks to TVET and the, the pride of prominence that we expect that TVET to I'm just to that. There is really no deviation between um, the policy pronouncements on TVET and what is captured in our education sector development plan. And so what is happening now is really no, there is really no divergence, you know, in that. But I think too that consideration in terms of policy must be given to address some of what we can consider to be challenges that we will experience at the operational level. So for example, you, it might be prudent for us to now start to consider the structure of our schools. Mm-hmm. I mean, typically we look at schools with a principal, a vice principal, etc. We've set classes from 8 to 3 o'clock. Um, we probably would want to look at how to change or make the structure a bit more flexible to allow us to be able to capture what really happens in an institution where you're providing training in occupational areas. So your Agricultural class might not run for 35 minutes. Or if you're doing fitness or whatever it is, there's some sporting area. You might want to start that at 10 o'clock in the morning and run until 1 o'clock. And you don't want it to be a situation where the unions are speaking about, you know, the conditions of work, mm-hmm. you know, for their members. And so these are some areas that I think policy consideration also has to um, reflect on. How do you see the TVET project now? And how do you see it? fitting and being more well integrated in society two, five, and ten years down the line? Ten years down the line, I would like to see our four institutions become schools of choice. Mm -hmm. And I can see them becoming schools of choice for our students and for parents because there would be a more, there would be greater interaction or collaboration between Ministry of Education, training facilities, and our other stakeholders, especially employers and industry partners. And so I think when persons begin to see the success of what our TV schools are doing, then we can see it becoming a school of choice. I see too that 10 years down the line, that our TV schools will also support the drive towards workforce development and also contribute towards the upskilling and retooling of the adult learner. Mm -hmm. And with all of this investment that we're making in TVET right now in the schools, I don't think this is something that should be underutilized, where we close our schools at 3 p.m. and and that's it. Mm -hmm. I think our facility should be open past 3 o'clock to allow for adult learning um, to take place. And so this is my vision for, you know, the the TVET schools, that it becomes a place of choice and that we're able to utilize the spaces, you know, for adult adult learning, allowing us to you know, develop our workforce. And given your long history and passion that you just ooze for this TVET <laughs> project, I hope that you are around and you still have a strong hand in seeing that come to fruition. Michelle, you told me not to call you Dr. Charles. Michelle. Call you Michelle. Michelle. That's uh, ideal. Mm-hmm. Michelle. Yep. How would you say the idea for transforming four schools came about, as you had mentioned, four institutions are going to be transformed mm-hmm. a little while ago? Well, I can see that this concept was born out of 
the conversation, discussion with the Honorable Sean Edward. When Sean, when the minister took up the responsibility as the Minister of Education, in our early discussions on the policy and the mandate of the Ministry of Education, TVF was one of the, these areas that we touched on. And our vision was very well aligned. And so from then and the seeds of the transformation of the secondary schools, the seeds were sown. Mm -hmm. For secondary schools, and this is no small feat. It isn't. Many people have said, why didn't we just start with one? Hmm. Why four then? Oh, because we recognize that these schools were already on a path that pursued TVET um, training, and the students at the school seemed to be very much interested in doing it. So we didn't do it on a small scale. We just went big. And um, honestly, I've had the, the, the personal and first-hand experience of experiencing some of these schools and seeing what the students are doing. And honestly, I myself, uh, I'm excited to what the future brings in terms of uh, the workforce, how it's going to change that, how we are going to break away from standardized examinations, how we are going to cater to more facets of society and more intellectual types. Um, I'm really excited about that part. I can tell. <laughs> So the four schools you mentioned, right? We have interesting disciplines, and for those who have not heard of what they are before, we have a school with arts, media, and design. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite disciplines in that is would be the photography aspect of it. Um, not to steal a line from Buna Boy, but mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated at the fact that we could become tested, approved, and trusted <laughs> in subject areas that we actually really enjoyed mm -hmm. and not the traditional subjects that have been available to us before. So we have School of Arts, Media, and Design. Mm -hmm. We also have a School of Construction and Heritage. Yes. A School of Innovation and Technology. And the school I most recently visited, a School of Sustainable Agriculture and culinary arts and yeah. I had the privilege of sampling some of the products from the students at the School of um, Sustainable Agriculture and Culinary Arts as part of the Community Tourism Cookery which I, I just found the name interesting and you know that, that just brought some light to me so tell me Michelle, tell me about these schools their disciplines um, give me some info into that Yes, I mean I, I can recall when we started, you know, identifying the various programs to be offered at the schools, how we were going to differentiate the schools. And people were talking about, oh, we don't want to just come up with sexy names. But of course, these are not sexy names. These are very applicable. These are the areas where the careers of the future, you know, these areas, that's where the careers of the future. These are the areas where the careers of the future are heading mm -hmm. into. And so when you look at sustainable agriculture and culinary arts, community cookery, these are practical and very relevant subject areas. You look at innovation and technology, and we're just not talking about sustainable de development goals, you know, just like that. All of those career areas, those occupational areas, would put us on a trajectory to allow us to meet our SDGs. And so, of course, these are very exciting areas that any student would want to pursue. These are areas that would speak to their passion. And I've had engagements with a number of students. And while you mentioned those um, broad topics, I could say, too, that every one of those schools, there are some other personal services that the students can pursue. So the student who wants to become a barber. Mm -hmm. I recently had the opportunity to listen to a gentleman who attended the Miku Secondary School some years ago, and he's now a barber in the, in the U.S., and he is like a barber to the stars, you can say, because some of the big actors have gone through his grooming, his grooming place. And he initially said, you know, this is what he wanted to do, but his mother never really wanted him to do this. But at our schools, there is a space for persons who want to be barbers, for persons who want to go into massage therapy, nail technician, hair braiding, on top of all of these other areas. And these subjects, are, these, these occupational areas are not just standalone, but you also get to do the related CVC and CXCs for the students who wants to be able to get that kind of a balance. So you do get the regular math, English. You get the so math, forth. English. You can get, if you're going into fitness, then you can get the HSB, human and social biology aspects of it. And so, yes, if you're doing construction, there is the technical drawing and the building construction aspects. You know, that's align with the occupational area. So it, it seeks to marry the academic aspect in addition to a robust technical aspect yes. to make a more wholesome, comprehensive learning That's experience. Right. That's exactly. So when we speak about developing, you know, the holistic development of yes, the individual, yes, yes. and we're not just looking at the theory side, but the development of the competencies and the yes. skills, you know, this is what we're talking about. Lovely, lovely. Uh, they are, from my understanding, there are different entry points 
as it is currently, we have um, children do, well, it's no longer common entrance, it's CPA, yeah. and this episode will be released around the time <laughs> results are going to be out. Mm-hmm. Um, you have CPA, you go to your secondary school, and then from there, at some point, you pick a set of subjects. And that's what you are tasked with mm-hmm. for the duration of your, your tenure at that school. However, under Tibet, this is being done a little, a little bit differently. Uh, from my understanding, there are different entry points. I think grades 7, seven nine, and 9 and 12 in the long run. Tell me, a little in bit the medium ab- term. tell me a little bit about those various entry points and why these? Yeah, so the students would choose to come in at grade 7, which is the students who would have just written the CPE exam and assigned to that particular school. Like it could very well have been the school of choice. But you also find entry could happen at the grade 9 level. Mm-hmm. And this would be the students who would have gone to the regular secondary school and by the time they had completed Form 2, mm-hmm. would have decided, you know, I really want to pursue a career, say, in design, fashion design, mm-hmm. or photography, or in construction, or in agriculture. And then this student is given the opportunity now to be able to transfer to one of our the TVET institutions to pursue the, that career of their dream. And so this is what allows, you know, that flexibility in the TVET system, in our TVET secondary school system, where the students can come in at that point. And from my understanding, there's also a grade 12 that will be on stream. So if you didn't do it before, mm-hmm. you still allow the student that flexibility to say, you know what, mm-hmm. hey, I am now. I may not have had the, the faculties to make such a grave choice at that point in my development, but I can do it later. Yes, indeed, that is an option. But also the grade 12 entry level would most likely be speaking to a higher level of the CPQ because let's say, for example, the students who would have gradu- graduated from secondary school with them, say, five CXCs. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the equivalency, the levels, how you, and that's, I guess, for a whole other conversation, like what each level of a CBQ means and how it's, it's equivalent to another area. So that student might come in and say already with maybe core CXC subjects, um, which would equate to a particular level in the CBQ, but then that student can now decide to pursue a higher level CBQ if they so desire. Exactly. And I, I must say, too, that many persons seem to be a little bit, you know, hesitant about the CBQs and the matriculation process for the students who would have gone to secondary school. And I'm excited to see that even the student who wants to attend the South Louis Community College, at the moment, South Arthur accepts students with math and English and a level one CBQ. So there is, you know, that pipeline for students to be able to continue their education. That's lovely. That's lovely. You mentioned um, you are now able to enter, but let us look at the facet of society post the average school age. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a term earlier, had never heard it before, but I think I'll hang on to it for now. It was called workforce development. And this is all, all of this is done to foster a more more holistic uh, development of a student Mm -hmm. to put them in the workforce. Yes. Tell me a little bit about society. Once we have certified more students in these technical aspects, how is the workforce going to accept these students and how they are going to be more productive once they get to that, that level of life? You know, I really find that question very interesting um, because when we start looking at workforce developments, we're looking to see how we can develop our, lab- um, our labor force, our workforce to be able to meet the needs of, ma- of the market. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but as persons, and you can look at what happened locally after COVID, where persons were displaced in terms of jobs and persons had to find new areas in which they, they wanted to go into. And this allowed for greater opportunity to upskill and retool, you know, for individuals. And so with these institutions, I see that opportunity being presented, allowing us to be able to develop different skills. And TVET is not an education thing in isolation of industry and employment. And so as the student who goes through this TVET program has the opportunity to do internships or apprenticeships within industry, wherever they choose to go. And so the industry partner is now able to get first pick up the student who comes out with the school with the skills that are relevant to their, work, their workplace area. And so you bridge or you narrow that gap in terms of the, the skills gap that everybody um, tends to speak about, which exists really. You also can see persons now becoming more entrepreneurial. So persons could now decide I'm going to open up my own barber shop. I'm going to be my own masseuse. I'm going to do something. And in doing so too, they can employ other persons as well. And so you find the development of a more robust um, workforce persons who are now doing things that, are, that they're more passionate and interested in. And all of this could, you know, result in creating greater economic growth, economic development for our country. 
and increase our labor productivity. I love that. I love that. Um, I know the audience will have a million more questions <laughs> for us, but unfortunately, we have to wind down. Um, before you go, Michelle, just one, one final question, if you don't mind. As you prepare to officially retire from the government service, mm -hmm. and as a parent, what advice would you leave with the public? You know, parents sometimes are very skeptical especially when new things are about to unfold. So about this time, you'd find that students would have written CPA, results are coming out, and you hear that your child is being assigned to Grand Riviere or Stanley John Odlum, and, you know, there's this trepidation that exists. But I want parents to know, really, that there is nothing to fear and want to encourage them to embrace this new um, path that is being offered within our mainstream education system because it can only augur well for our students' growth and development, the holistic development of the child. And so I want to leave that appeal um, to parents and even the broader society that this initiative is one that should be embraced. However, my greater appeal would be to industry partners and employers because all of this investment in TVETs would be for naught if they are not on board. And TVETs cannot work in isolation of industry. So, and there is a big role for industry partners to play and I want them to be willing to embrace and to come on board and to make this thing a reality because at the end of the day, this only speaks to the development of our country, improved quality of life, in essence, a better, happier society, happier people. We would see in education a lower dropout rate. We would find students gravitating towards subjects that appeal to them. Um, persons, our youth becoming more meaningfully and gainfully engaged. And so I see, you know, I really want to encourage persons to embrace this initiative. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michelle. I'd like to congratulate you on your retirement and thank you for all the work that you're putting behind the scenes and on the forefront when necessary to getting this done. I'd like to thank my audience for their attention. This was the first episode of Talking to Vet. Join us next week as we will have another guest who will delve into the subject with me and explore the ideas of the Tivet Transformation Project as we move on. Thank you and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.